Before we start, big news. The Global Bird Weekend is going to be on the 7th to 9th of October 2022. Incorporating the October Big Day, it's an opportunity to go birding and raise awareness about the stresses and challenges that wild birds face. Global Birding, in association with eBird, BirdLife International and Swarovski Optic, will be hosting the weekend. As in previous events, I'll be leading a virtual team of birders from around the world and I want you to join us. And in case you were wondering, we welcome birders of all experience levels to the team. During the Global Bird Weekend, we'll go birding in our own locations and share our checklist with the team account to create a trip report that will help us see the species logged by the team. In the weeks leading up to the event, there'll be exclusive online sessions for the members of the Casual Birder podcast team. To join us, please visit the link in the episode notes. Welcome to the Casual Birder podcast. I'm Susie Buttress. As a casual birder, I take pleasure in watching the wild birds around me, wherever I am. In my show, I share the joy of birding. I tell you about the birds I've seen, speak with experts and enthusiasts, go on bird outings, and I share stories from birders around the world. In case you missed it, last episode I spoke with Sarah Humphrey, known on social media as Sussex Sarah. It's another in my conversations recorded at Global Bird Fair. Sarah shares her passion for wildlife photography, low-carbon birding, and educating others in responsible wildlife watching. Do take a listen. And this Wednesday, August 24th at 6pm BST, Sarah is hosting a live Q&A on Instagram to answer questions and share tips about spotting migrating birds that are now on the move. Follow Sarah on Instagram and join the session. You can find her at Sussex underscore Sarah, and that's Sarah spelt S-A-R-A. The link is in the episode notes. If you'd like to support the show's production, you can buy me a virtual coffee at ko-fi.com. My thanks to everyone who supported the show in this way, and special thanks to Mary Lee, Kimberly and Sabrina, who contributed to the show's tip jar after the last episode. You can also support the show by speaking about it on social media or leaving a review. This goes a long way in encouraging others to try out the show. Please remember to tag me in your posts so that I can share them too. Back in July, my husband John and I were tempted out to a localish reserve, Martin Down, which we had been meaning to visit for some time. Martin Down is a chalk downland made up of undulating hills covered in meadows, wildflowers, scrub and hedges. We were drawn there having seen reports on eBird of turtle dove, corn bunting and grey pheasant. The last two species would be life birds for me. The turtle dove is a rare bird to see nowadays. It's our smallest dove and migrates to Africa for the winter. I heard my first turtle dove ever in Suffolk last year so I was quite excited to think that I might hear them and possibly see them again so close to home. Corn buntings are heavy-set small birds, brown with darker brown streaks and thick bills. It's a species that has suffered huge reductions in population over the last 40 years, mainly due to reduced seed and insect food available to them in their farmland habitats. And the grey partridge has suffered the same fate as corn buntings, a reduction in available food leading to a massive decline in the population. The grey partridge is a medium-sized bird which spends most of its time on the ground. After we visited Martin Down, we went to one of our favourite reserves, Blashford Lakes, where there are hides overlooking flooded gravel pits and woodland trails. In the early evening, after the hides were shut, John and I sat down with a coffee to review our afternoon of birding. We're sitting outside the turn hide at Blashford Lakes, I'm having a coffee, it's a gorgeous summer evening, blue skies, black-headed gulls flying over, um, commenting on us being here, I think. We've been out birding in two sites today. We went at lunchtime to Martin Down in Hampshire, and from there we drove down to Blashford Lakes to just spend the last couple of hours of the afternoon before they shut. All the hides are shut now, and the car park shut, so... Uh, we're just sitting at this picnic table to review the day. And it's been quite a successful day, hasn't it? It has. It's been amazing. We had a few species we were hoping to see before setting out. 
but yeah, I think we've seen much more than we were uh, hoping to. The target birds that we had set out to see today were turtle dove and corn bunting, and we were hoping for grey partridge. Now, when we were in Suffolk last year, that was the first time I'd ever heard turtle dove. Did mm. you hear them there as well? Yeah, I did. Okay, yeah. so that was a lifer for both of us last yes. year. Had you ever yeah. seen corn buntings before? I think I have, but probably a very long time ago. And we certainly very rarely see them around where we go, but that was one of the main reasons for going to Martin Down, because um, we knew that was meant to be a particularly good location for them. And grey partridge I've never seen, but you've seen before? I have, again, but very rarely, just by chance, you know, if, if they've wandered out across the road or something like that. Right, right. So I was, I was hoping that we would see those. But anyway, when John went a couple of weeks ago, he prepared himself by checking out sounds or the calls that they might make. Because sometimes when you go out, you don't actually see the birds you want to see, but you might hear them. But unless you know what they sound like, you won't know that you've heard them. So, John, do you want to tell us about your process for identifying the birds that you wanted to see, your target species? Yes, yeah, so really, it was knowing those species that I was likely to see but really wasn't very familiar with, so corn bunting, turtle dove and grey partridge, uh, listening on, um, on the bird watching apps that I have on my uh, smartphone. I think we both have the same apps, um, UKI Bird Pro and Collins Bird Guide. So both of them include sound clips, which I find increasingly useful. As I'm getting more and more familiar with identifying birds, I'm finding it increasingly helpful to be able to rely on sounds as well. And because the corn buntings in particular, I really didn't know what they sounded like. Uh, I thought it would really increase my chances of finding corn buntings at Martin Down if I listened to, uh, to what they sound like on the app before heading out. We were familiar with um, turtle dove, as you said, because we'd heard those. They have a nice, I'd say, I'd describe a very sort of um, gentle, churring sort of sound. Corn buntings, very, very different. They have a, a sound a bit like, um, to me, it sounds a bit like someone rattling some keys very quickly and then maybe dropping the keys on the, on the counter so the sound suddenly stops. And then on my recce a few weeks ago, long before I saw it, my first corn bunting, I heard that sound and immediately knew what it was, having done my homework before setting off. That definitely enabled me to, uh, to see my first corn bunting when I did the recce trip. And on that trip and today, when we've been out, it's really helped. It's a very distinctive sound. You start to hear it all the time once you know what it sounds like. And a lot of the time when you hear it, that leads to you being able to get your bins on the bird and, and see it as well. So when you heard it a couple of weeks ago and you recognised it, what did you do then? Were you scanning all the, all the tops of the bushes or whatever? Yeah, ex exactly that. Yeah, I, th I thought I'd heard it and I, I was scanning with my binoculars along the tops of hedgerows and bushes and eventually saw the bird that was making the sound. Um, quite a way off, actually, so the sound was carrying quite well, but... Um, once I had the binoculars on the bird, I could definitely tell that the, the sound was coming from that bird. And then before we went out today, you made sure that I listened to the app. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I wanted to remind myself as well, because you know, still, I've still very rarely seen and heard them, so I wanted to remind myself as well. Yeah, how would you describe the sound? So recently I've learned the wood warbler call which sounds like a coin being spun and then as it loses momentum it sort of rattles and lands and, and that's what it sounds like and I thought that the corn bunting sounded a bit like that but that it went on a bit longer almost like the the coin almost stopped and then carried on and then stopped it was really useful that I had listened because as soon as we got out of the car when we were at the we went to the lower car park and as soon as we got out of the car we heard one mm. and if I hadn't listened to the app I would have thought oh that sounds a bit different but I wouldn't have been sure that's what it was and actually a yellow hammer was also calling and um, at one point I did get confused between the two because I wasn't always hearing the cheese bit <laughs> that the yellow hammers do when they go a little bit of bread and no cheese um, so I was just hearing the, the trill beforehand and I thought oh that's a, a corn bunting then as well <laughs> John very rightly pointed out no that's the yellow hammer 
but that's okay <laughs> we're all learning and then towards the end of the walk and oh boy it was a hot day and we really shouldn't have gone out that late but yes it was my fault I'm always late getting out um but towards the end of the walk there was several calling and always on the top of her hedge are a shrub quite a largish finch-like bird with a sort of chunky bill and light brown with dark brown streaks down it so it was really good to see one as well because that was a lifer for me just popping in here with a recording of a corn bunting that I made that day. Do you think it sounds like a bunch of keys rattling? Or maybe similar to a coin being spun and then settling? And we heard turtle dove, but again didn't see any. Uh, but one of them sounded very close. It sounded like it was just the other side of, of a tree, um, but we just couldn't see it. And here's the recording I made of that turtle dove. So we were also looking for grey partridge today. Uh, we listened to the call before we left so we'd be familiar with what it might sound like. Unfortunately, I had no luck at all. But that's OK. We know they're found there. We could try another day. This episode is brought to you by Casual Birder Weekly, the show's newsletter. I connect with you in lots of places, the show's Facebook group, Instagram and Twitter. But because of the hectic pace of social media, it's not easy to make sure that everyone has seen the latest news. Casual Birder Weekly is a great way for us all to stay in touch. Each week, I share exclusive updates and videos about the birds I've seen, tips to help you get the best birding experiences, and I let you know about any planned group birdwatch events. Sign up now. The link is in the episode notes. After we left Martin Down, it's just about 30 minutes to get to Blashford Lakes, so we thought our old favourite, let's come here. We can use the facilities and sit in the hides for a bit because it's still a very, very hot day. Sometimes it's quite cold sitting in the hides, but when it's really hot out, it's really quite pleasant having the windows open and sitting in a hide. So we were going to go for a walk into the reserve. We only had about an hour and a half before it was closing. But the person at the information desk said that there'd been... Oh, no, it was you looking at the boards wasn't it you saw that there'd been mm. a black swan and a ruddy shell duck and a few things that we hadn't seen well hadn't seen this year and some of them hadn't seen before so we thought actually we'll come straight down to the turn hide and spend the last hour just watching what we could see here and that turned out to be really good too so often in a hide you'll find there's someone there that is willing to share some information with you and there was a guy with a tripod and scope and he let us know that there was a barnacle goose visible on the other side of the shore, which neither of us saw because we didn't have scope with us. But he also pointed out a common sandpiper, which was right under our noses. But because we were looking off across the lake, <laughs> we didn't notice. So that was a first of year for both of us. Not for you. <laughs> oh, when did I see You one? saw them when you were with Annika. That's not this year, though. Yeah, it was. was it? When we were in the Forest of Dean and you did that. Oh, gosh, is that this year? <laughs> first of the year for me <laughs> so that was a first of year for John not for me because I saw one when I was on a walk with Annika in the forest of Dean earlier this year we saw the black swan almost immediately yeah I made a joke I said <laughs> what colour is it <laughs> <laughs> there were lots and lots of mute swans and one black swan and it was quite obvious which one it was <laughs> um, but I made that Bird laughed, didn't I? You did. I yeah. <laughs> don't know if he knew I was serious or joking. I but... didn't. I didn't know if you were joking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a um, Egyptian goose just flying over. Oh wow! <laughs> <laughs> um, so the black swan. I don't know if it's you know escaped from a wildfowl collection because black swans are native to Australia. They're very often found in wildfowl collections. Yeah, there's a, there's a collection not too far from here at a place called Abbotsbury isn't mm. there where I think there are black swans so maybe it's escaped from there but we've we've come to Blashford Lakes several times this year and it's the first time we've seen it here 
but the fact that it's on the boards and that mm. eBird allowed us to record it, I guess you do get them living feral. Because if it had just been an escapee from a collection, mm. we wouldn't want to record it. No, exactly. Um, and then my highlight of the day was I saw the common sandpiper again running along shore and I was just videoing it and um, narrating us to John as I, as I said, oh, there it is again. And as I did, I realised there was a, a plover in, in the foreground, um, a ringed plover. And the birder previously had said, oh, the little ringed plover's over there. Now, a little ringed plover, as you may have heard in my, um, when I was sitting in the bay with Natasha, we were talking about little ringed plovers and the difference between common ringed plovers and little ringed plovers. And the thing that I was particularly looking for was a yellow eye ring. And I was extremely delighted that when I saw this plover, it was indeed a little ring plover. It turned to the side, started running, and I could absolutely see its yellow ring around its eye. So that is a lifer for me. So I was extremely happy about that. And I pointed it out to John and he got it as well. Lifer for me too. So thank you very much. Excellent. So it was handy that that man had said, although it had said little ring plover on the board back up at the information yeah, lodge. Yeah. But, you know, sometimes those are mentioned and it's often with people with scopes that have seen things way off in the distance. So the chance of seeing mm. it are, are fairly remote. Um, what else do we see? Oh, they've got lots of Egyptian geese here. They have got a ruddy shell duck. So I looked that up and it's uh, quite a smooth coloured bird with a ring, uh, a collar, a darker collar. Looks a bit like a Egyptian goose, but without all the extra markings. And actually there are so many birds on the lake and quite a long way out. I did scan and look for it, but I couldn't see it. So, but at least I knew what it was going to look like if I did see it. But we did see a grey wagtail. John pointed that out and we saw I think a juvenile stone chat and linnets and what else lapwings we sat there probably for about an hour and we got a really good list of, of birds in that time so even though it's yeah. you know midsummer and lots of people say oh there's not much going on there was enough that kept us occupied then we've just gone for a short walk in the woods after we got thrown out the hide because <laughs> they shut at 4 30 um, actually they shut a little bit later tonight I think it takes a while for the, the person who's doing all the closing of the hides to get round to us so that was lucky, we got about 15 minutes extra um, but then we went for a walk into the wood and we heard a jay we saw a pair of black cap and a willow wall, uh, no a chiff chaff and then we've had some swallows flying around and a couple of sand martins which we hadn't seen when we were sitting in the hide so that was quite nice and added extra and as you've heard the black-headed gulls and Egyptian goose flying over so it's been a really nice day actually my lifers have been the little ringed plover the corn bunting and then my first of year have been a turtle dove and you've had well you had the little ringed plover the little ringed plover and um the bird will think the common sandpiper was a lifer for me because I Although I th I'm sure I've seen them in the past, since I've been recording on eBird, I I've not seen one. So, so that's great. Thank you for making me listen to the, the sounds before we went out, because that really meant that I felt confident hearing the corn bunting as soon as I did and identifying it. Well, thank you, because um, I think I was probably deaf to most bird sounds before... Um, before you encouraged me to listen so uh, yeah I probably wouldn't have even done that if it hadn't been for you and actually yeah that's a really good point that you know when you're out for a walk if you're able to listen for the bird sounds around you because I think you remarked a couple of weeks ago when we were out for a walk that you were picking up so many more birds now that you knew what to listen for and you could confidently add them to your eBird list um, whereas before you might have gone out for a walk and it would have just been a wall of sound or it would have just been sound in the background but you wouldn't have identified individual species so you would have felt like oh if I haven't seen any I've not really there's been no birds around definitely definitely yeah I think that's probably the basis for a whole new episode <laughs> <laughs> oh excellent <laughs> <laughs> so that's us we'll just finish our last drop of coffee and head on home we saw 15 species at Martin Down including the turtle dove and corn bunting there were two other types of pigeon there, stock dove and common wood pigeon. We also saw buzzard, jackdaw, raven and red kite, and a few of the smaller birds, chiff chaff, white throat, yellow hammer, goldfinch and one house sparrow. And at Blashford Lakes that afternoon, I saw 26 species, including the lifer little ringed plover. 
I ended up taking the black swan off my list. I decided it was most likely an escapee and I'd rather save it for a possible future trip to Australia to include the bird on my list. You know how much I love to hear about the birds you're seeing. This week, in the show's Facebook group, Rob and Alison shared a trip report from a visit to Gibraltar Point, a national nature reserve near Skegness in Lincolnshire. This is what they wrote. There had been a number of migrants reported through in the previous days, which made the 4am alarm more tolerable. This week, we remembered the flasks and coffee, so that was a good start. Aside, last week they left them on their kitchen counter. And we arrived to an empty car park, apart from four of the ponies, which are used for grazing management work around the reserve. They were interested in apples from a tree on the edge of the car park, but one decided a close look in the boot of our car would be more interesting. It took an apple thrown a few yards away to move him, so we could close the boot without giving him a headache. We headed towards the scrubby area around the observatory hut first, and a couple of laps of the area soon found one of our main targets for the day. Brief views of a common red start snatching a midge from just above its perch. A family of common white throats moved in and took over feasting on the midges, and the red start wasn't seen again there. Good numbers of other warblers were here too, with chiffchaff, blackcap and willow warblers in abundance, and good numbers of yellow wagtails moving south overhead. Next, we wandered up through the east dunes towards the Mill Hill viewpoint. We had good views of a dark juvenile marsh harrier drifting south above us, and found two more common red starts. This time, undisturbed, we watched them feeding on more midges, their tails quivering typically between forays. Also through the dunes, we saw a pied flycatcher, target number two for the day. Both species were county ticks for us too. When we got to Mill Hill, we joined Kevin, the head warden, and another birder, and exchanged notable sightings. We've chatted to Kevin there on a number of our visits this year. They'd seen a wind chat nearby, but that one eluded us on the day. This is probably the best viewpoint of the sea for us at the moment, while Stig, our dog, is rightly not allowed on the beach. And Kevin is an ace when it comes to identifying birds passing by and soon got us onto a gargane flying south with a group of teal. Turn passage was slowing down, but we did see sandwich, common and little terns pass by. They had seen two roseates with a large group of sandwich tern just before we arrived. Yellow wagtails continued a steady stream overhead in small groups. By this time, the visitor centre was open and Cake was calling us. We did find a wimble on the way back and just outside the centre we saw a smart northern wheat ear. Suitably refreshed, we headed off to the hides around Jackson's Marsh. There were only three spoonbills out here, although we later saw another 11 roosting from Lil's hut at the Wash viewpoint. There was an impressive number of black-tailed godwits in various plumage stages – The other birder from Mill Hill had counted 441 before they were spooked and he had to start again. We left him to it and moved on. A presumably juvenile rough gave us a minor ID headache, but we got there in the end. Numbers of green sandpipers seem to be up all around at the moment and we saw three out on the marsh. Also, here we saw the Hebridean sheep flock, presumably coming for a drink. They're also here for grazing management work. The lure of more cake got the better of us. Another trip to the visitor centre was followed by a walk to Mill Hill by a different route. It was very quiet in front of each of the hides on the way, though. All in all, another great day out. Just over nine hours on the reserve, 7.2 miles walked, 62 species seen in total, two year ticks, both of which are county ticks too, plus a third new 2022 Lincolnshire bird. We'd previously seen Wimbrel in Kent. Thanks so much for telling us about your trip, Rob and Alison. That was really lovely. I came along with you on it. So many birds that you mentioned that I'd really love to see. I've been to Gibraltar Point once before many years ago, but uh, it sounds like a fantastic location and one that I should really try to visit again. If you'd like to share your bird sightings or trip reports with me for the show, please use the contact form on my website. As always, the links are in the episode notes. My thanks to Randy Braun for designing the artwork for the show. The theme music is Short Sleeve Shirt by The Drones. Thanks to them for letting me use it. Check out their website at dronesmusic.net. Thank you all for listening, and I hope you'll join me again for another episode of the Casual Birder podcast.